So lately, there's been a lot of gun control, guys, either proposed or enacted. Let's think about the bump stock ban. The ban's gone into effect. And the ATF several times said, this is not a machine gun. It can't be a machine gun. There's a law that already defines machine gun, and this just doesn't fit. But they changed it around with this real convoluted argument that they used in court to make it where you don't even know what a machine gun is anymore. I don't even think they know what it is. And does it even matter? How many fingers am I holding up right now? Why does that matter? Now, we also have a Bill of Rights. And we have the Second Amendment. And we have the Fifth Amendment. And then we go on further as amended to the Fourteenth Amendment. And we have all these things that have been taught to us that are truths that, look, the government cannot take your guns away. The government needs to make sure that you're secure in your effects and in your papers against unreasonable search and seizure. That you have the right to privacy. That you have rights to own property in this country. And if your property is taken by the government, that you will be given due and just compensation. That's what we've been taught. That's what's written. But then again, what does all this even mean? And how, how many fingers am I holding up right now? We just had a hearing in the Senate just two days ago where we had the Republican chairman saying, well, look, I'm a big fan of the Second Amendment. I'm a gun owner. But all rights can have reasonable restrictions. Well, what is reasonable? Is it reasonable for you to deduce how many fingers I'm holding up right now? Now look, here's the problem right now. There's a lot of like what we what we consider to be precedent that's happened, like the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, law, law that's created as stated in the Constitution by legislators. But are legislators even making most of our laws anymore? Who is actually held accountable right now to actually stand up for our rights? Is it anybody in the government at all? Or is it just us? And as far as we're concerned, do we even know whose side we're on anymore? Because when it's so confusing, where you have the people that are supposed to be on our side, the Republicans, they claim they're on our side with gun rights, and the chairman starts off saying, look, I'm going to hold this hearing on red flag laws which obviously violate many of the core principles of the foundation of this country, as stated in the Bill of Rights, rights that the government is supposed to be hands off, they can't touch. But what do these rights even mean anymore? Like, it's literally gotten to the point where I keep going back to that same analogy. How many fingers am I holding up? And as far as governments coming in, reaching in, changing everything that the people understand, trying to trying to rewrite history where you don't even know what happened in the past, where you're so caught up in today that you don't even know what's happened in the past that we can look for it to help predict the future. Because things have happened in the past, people. With all this gun control, and I'm going to further clarify and call it control. Control of people has happened before, guys. nineteen seventeen the Bolsheviks took control of Russia during the October Revolution of nineteen seventeen establishing the Russian Socialist Federated Soviet Republic a precursor to the USSR the Sundersized note was among the first issues of the new communist government I would note this was over a hundred years ago and again What's going on here, guys? Is this really about guns? Is this really about bump stocks? For those of you that said you didn't care about the bump stocks, did you happen to look in the past and see what this is all about? Did you wonder why they're so focused on this piece of plastic that we all know is not a machine gun? Do you think they even care about machine guns at all? I'm starting to think no. None of this gun control is about the gun. Because... What is a gun? A gun is an inanimate tool that can be used for either bad things or for good things, depending on who the person is. 
the way we look at our gun rights is that we could use our guns to stand up against tyranny, to protect these documents that I've listed before, <clears throat> the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, etc. But what good are our guns going to do, <clears throat> excuse me, to fight for liberty and to resist tyranny if we don't even know how many fingers I'm holding up? And with that said, I think it's time for a story time, guys. And I'm going to read a couple pages here. And this video may last a few minutes, but I think this topic deserves a few minutes. So I'm going to read from none other than George Orwell's 1984. And the excerpt I'm going to read from is a couple pages, and it's going to be out of Book 3, Chapter 2. This particular publisher here, it's page 248. It may vary depending on who published your copy. So just real quickly here, you guys are going to need to read the book to really get all of it, but I think this point makes a lot of sense right now when it comes to why is the ATF able to just change its mind on previous rulings? Why is the Republican senator trying to get us to accept different rationales and reasonings? And when the Republican senator did so, why did the Democrat senator Feinstein come in and say, well, yeah, that's a good start, but then we need the registry, the universal background checks, the confiscation, the assault weapons ban, the high capacity magazine ban. Why did they all say this? And there's a lot of people out there saying this is something new. And I showed you this already as a reminder. And then this book also talks about this exact topic. So real quick background. Basically, we have a guy named Winston and O'Brien. O'Brien's torturing Winston to try to get him to come to some some type of, of, of good sense, or let's just say um, some common sense, some sanity. He's trying to bring Winston to, quote, sanity. Sanity according to who? Okay. So it starts off saying, there is a party slogan dealing with the control of the past, he says. Repeat it if you please. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past repeated Winston obediently. Who controls the present controls the past, said O'Brien, nodding his head with slow approval. Is it your opinion, Winston, that the past has real existence? Again, the feeling of helplessness descended upon Winston. His eyes flitted towards the dial. He not only did not know whether yes or no was the answer that would save him from pain, he did not even know what answer he believed to be the true one. He's got him hooked up to a torture device, guys. <clears throat> O'Brien smiled faintly. You are no metaphysician, Winston, he said. Until this moment, you had never considered what is meant by existence. I will put it more precisely. Does the past exist concretely in space? Is there somewhere or other a place, a world of solid objects where the past is still happening? No. Then where does the past exist, if at all? In records. It's written down. In records and... In the mind, in human memories, in memory, very well then. We, the party, control all records, and we control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? But how can you stop people remembering things, cried Winston, again, momentarily forgetting the dial. It is involuntary. It's outside of oneself. How can you control memory? You have not controlled mine. O'Brien's manner grew stern again. He laid his hand on the dial. On the contrary, he said, you have not controlled it. That is what has brought you here. You are here because you have failed in humanity and self-discipline. You would not make the act of submission, which is the price of sanity. Isn't that kind of funny that that's what our current people are talking about here? That you have to have concessions. You have to accept reasonable controls or else you're not considered reasonable or sane. You preferred to be a lunatic, a minority of one. Only the disciplined mind can see reality, Winston. You believe that reality is something objective, external, existing in its own right. You also believe that the nature of reality is self-evident. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Don't we hear self-evident in a finding document? When you delude yourself into thinking that you see something, you assume that everyone else sees the same thing as you. But I tell you, Winston, that reality is not external. Reality, reality exists in the human mind and nowhere else. Not in the individual mind, which can make mistakes, and in any case soon perishes. Only in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. Whatever the party holds to be truth is truth. 
It is impossible to see reality except by looking through the eyes of the party. That is the fact that you have got to relearn, Winston. It needs an act of self-destruction, an effort of the will. You must humble yourself before you can become sane. He paused for a few moments as though to allow what he had been saying to sink in. Do you remember, he went on, writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. Yes, said Winston. O'Brien held up his left hand. It's back towards Winston with the thumb hidden with the four fingers extended. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says it is not four but five, then how many? Four. The word ended in a gasp of pain. The needle of the dial had shot up to 55. The sweat had sprung out all over Winston's body. The air tore into his lungs and issued again in deep groans, which even by clenching his teeth, he could not stop. O'Brien watched him. The four fingers still extended. He drew back the lever. This time the pain was only slightly eased. How many fingers, Winston? Four. The needle went up to 60. How many fingers, Winston? Four, four. What else can I say? Four. The needle must have risen again, but he did not look at it. The heavy, stern face and four fingers filled his vision. The fingers stood up before his eyes like pillars, enormous, blurry, and seeming to vibrate, but unmistakably four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it. Stop it. How can you go on? Four. Four. How many fingers, Winston? Five. 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 We cry and plead to the government, but are they really listening, or are they still pressing on to try to change the fundamental ways that we think. That's something I'd ask you guys to think about here. So Winston says, five, five, five. No, Winston, that is no use. You are lying. You still think there are four. How many fingers, please? Four, five, four, anything you like. Only stop it. Stop the pain. Abruptly, he was sitting with O'Brien's arm round his shoulders. He had perhaps lost consciousness for a few seconds. The bonds that had held his body down were loosened. He felt very cold. He was shaking uncontrollably. His teeth were chattering. The tears were rolling down his cheeks. For a moment, he clung to O'Brien like a baby, curiously comforted by the heavy arm around his shoulders. He had the feeling that O'Brien was his protector, that the pain was something that came from outside, from some other source, that it was O'Brien who would save him from it. You ever notice how once in a while the Republicans will come in and say, don't worry, we'll save you guys from this one, and then we look to them, that they're our friends, and they're the ones that are going to protect us. Just saying. You are a slow learner, Winston, said O'Brien gently. How can I help it, he blubbered. How can I help seeing it in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Winston, sometimes they are five. Sometimes they are three. Sometimes they are all of them at once. You must try harder. It's not easy to become sane. He laid Winston down on the bed. The grip of his limbs tightened again, but the pain had ebbed away and the trembling had stopped leaving him merely weak and cold. O'Brien motioned with his hand to the man in the white coat, who had stood immobile throughout the proceedings. The man in the white coat bent down, looked closely into Winston's eyes, followed his pulse, laid an ear against his chest, tapped here and there, then nodded to O'Brien. Again, said O'Brien. The pain flowed into Winston's body. The needle must have been at 70, 75. He had shut his eyes this time. He knew the fingers were still there, and still four, all that mattered was somehow to stay alive until the spasm was over. He had ceased to notice whether he was crying or not. The pain lessened again. He opened his eyes. O'Brien had drawn back the lever. How many fingers, Winston? Four. I suppose there are four. I would see five if I could. I'm trying to see five. Which do you wish? To persuade me that you see five or that you really see them? Uh, really to see them. Again, said O'Brien. Perhaps the needle was at 80, 90. Winston could only intermittently remember why the pain was happening. Behind his screwed up eyelids, a forest of fingers seemed to be moving in a short distance, weaving in and out, disappearing behind one another and reappearing again. He was trying to count them. He could not remember why. He only knew that it was impossible to count them and that this was somehow due to the mysterious identity between four and five. The pain died down again. When he opened his eyes, it was defined that he was still seeing the same thing, innumerable fingers like moving trees were still streaming past in either direction, crossing and recrossing. He shut his eyes again. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? I don't know. I don't know. You will kill me if you do that again. Four, five, six, in all honesty, I don't know. Better, said O'Brien. A needle slid into Winston's arm. Almost in the same 
and sent a blissful healing warmth spread all through his body. The pain was only half forgotten. He opened his eyes and looked up gratefully at O'Brien. At the sight of the heavy, lined face, so ugly, so intelligent, his heart seemed to turn over. If he could only have moved, he would have stretched out a hand and laid it on O'Brien's arm. He had never loved him so deeply as at this moment, and not merely because he had stopped the pain. The old feeling that at the bottom it did not matter whether O'Brien was a friend or enemy had come back. O'Brien was a person who could be talked to. Perhaps one did not want to be loved so much as to be understood. O'Brien had tortured him to the edge of lunacy, and in a little while it was certain he would send him to his death. It made no difference. In some sense, that went deeper than friendship. They were intimates. Somewhere or other, although the actual words might never be spoken, there was a place where they could meet and talk. O'Brien was looking down at him with an expression which suggested that the same thing might be on his own mind. When he spoke, it was an easy, conversational tone. Do you know where you are, Winston, he asked. I don't know. I can guess. In the Ministry of Love? Do you know how long you have been here? I don't know. Days, week, months? I think it's months. Why do you imagine that we bring people to this place? Uh, to make them confess? No, that's not the reason. Try again. To punish them? No, explained Brian. His voice had changed extraordinarily and his face had suddenly become stern and adamant. No, not merely to extract your confession, nor to punish you. Shall I tell you why we have brought you here? To cure you, to make you sane. Will you understand, Winston, that no one whom we bring to this place ever leaves our hands uncured? We do not understand in these stupid crimes that you have committed. We, I'm sorry, we are not interested in those stupid crimes that you have committed. The party is not interested in that overt act. The thought is all we care about. We do not merely destroy our enemies, we change them. Do you understand what I mean by that? Holy crap. It's like somebody wrote this, what's going on right now a long time ago, isn't it, guys? Are they really, really worried about the actual gun? Or are they worried about fundamentally changing us and curing us and making us sane according to their definitions? Are they trying to make it where the people like us that still remember what it's like to own guns and to have the freedoms and liberties, are they trying to make us forget? Are they trying to change the definition where we don't even know how many fingers they're holding up, let alone what liberty and freedom actually is? And if they make all of us forget what's going on and make this new way of thinking where it's reasonable to get rid of some of your gun rights and it's reasonable to give up some of your protection from searches and seizures and it's reasonable to let the government confiscate some of your property. If you let them take some, do you not think it's inevitable that they will be able to take all? Anyways, guys, I recommend this book. I think there's a lot going on right now that's basically very applicable. So I hope you guys enjoyed the story time with me. There's a lot to think about here. I'm the last person that's going to tell you how to think. Just think about what I just read to you. If you haven't read this book yet, read it. Start thinking about these things, guys. What's really going on here? When they say gun control, is it even about the guns or is it about control? All right, guys. Thanks for watching, and you guys have a good one.